Good day to all of you, and thank you for joining our event on the theme of inequality under COVID. Apologies for the delay. We had some technical difficulties. We're going to hear today from researchers who are on the cutting edge of exploring COVID's impact on inequality, as well as a dis distinguished panel of experts from around the world. If you were a poverty economist when COVID first hit, your reaction might have been, uh-oh, no more household surveys. These are the painstaking, time-consuming in-person surveys that measure household welfare in the developing world. Surveyors knock on doors and interview household members to find out what they eat, how much they earn, whether their kids are in school, and much more. Obviously, this couldn't happen during the pandemic. Yet, at the same time, the demand for information about the pandemic's impact was immense to inform the unprecedented ramp up in World Bank lending projects and for many other uses. So our poverty economists here at the World Bank devised a series of phone surveys to capture snapshots that we could use to answer those questions. We now have done surveys in over 100 countries and more than half of them are available publicly in a dashboard. So you can compare across countries, apples to apples. Most of the research that will be presented today is based at least in part on these phone surveys. Now, I want to turn to our new vice president for some opening remarks. Intermit Gill recently rejoined the World Bank after a few years away, and he is vice president of equitable. The COVID-19 increase in equality within countries. The second big question is, if COVID-19 has increased inequality, what can we do about it to level the playing field in recovery? In short, what can be done to prevent a potential downward spiral for the world's poor? The pandemic has cut a wide swath of destruction nearly everywhere, costing lives and livelihoods in developed and developing countries alike. In the early phases of the crisis, the COVID-19 pandemic devastated livelihoods even more in developing countries than developed countries. One indication of this comes from the phone surveys that the World Bank has fielded in many countries, so far, we have data from about 40 of them. The average share of households reporting income loss has been higher in low income countries, about 68%, compared to just 42% in high income countries. In short, COVID 19 is casting a long shadow over the world's poor. However, it's important to keep in mind, as Intermit mentioned, that the economic severity of the impact of COVID-19 in developing countries has not been experienced equally. In particular, key differences have emerged along three lines. The first is gender. Men and women have experienced the crisis very differently. And as you can see in this graph, women have been much more likely to stop work in the initial phase of the crisis. Miriam will speak in more detail about the gender differences of crisis impact shortly. The second key dimension of differences is age. We see that young workers were also more at risk from work stoppages than older workers. And finally, in terms of education, the less educated are also at particular risk from stopping work from the crisis. Ambar will speak more about that when he speaks later. It's important to keep in mind, however, that these are average patterns over a large number of countries. The crisis has not been experienced in a uniform way within each countries, and so this doesn't necessarily hold for every country, but there are clear average patterns that we're seeing. The different impacts that we see for individuals and workers are also translating to different impacts on households. In particular, in developing countries, less educated respondents were more likely to report income losses. For example, nearly two thirds of respondents with primary or less in terms of their educational attainment reported an income loss in the first wave of the surveys that we ran. On the other hand, only 54% of respondents with tertiary education reported that their households experienced an income loss. We see a similar pattern when we stratify respondents according to the size of their household. We also know that food insecurity was significantly higher among households affected by these job and income losses. Besides the difference in impacts, which were anti-poor, another factor to consider is that poor households have no cushion to absorb the blow and to bounce back quicker. They simply don't have the resources to respond and to recover. 
In short, evidence points to the poor and vulnerable being hardest hit in the short term. While everyone faced the same economic storm, the safety nets to protect people from the ravages of the pandemic were dramatically different. Social safety nets were largely inadequate in low and lower middle income countries. For example, social protection spending on COVID-19 related social protection measures in the United States has amounted to more than $4,200 per person. In contrast, in Sub-Saharan Africa, it was only $17 on average per person for the full 15 months between March 2020 and May 2021. This amounts to less than a nickel a day in social protection for the people of Africa. And finally, as Intermit mentioned, the learning loss, as best we can tell from the pandemic, has been higher in lower income countries and higher among children in the poorest households. In other words, disadvantaged children have struggled more than more advantaged children in maintaining their schooling. And again, we look at education of the respondent and household size as proxies for poverty. And you can see that better educated respondents and people in smaller households have been better able to maintain the learning of their children. The struggle to maintain schooling could permanently damage the future economic prospects of these poorer children and limit equality of opportunity. So to sum up, the crisis is that poor households hard, the most vulnerable workers and households in these countries harder, and poor children in poor households in poor countries the hardest. Now I'll turn it over to Miriam to explore the gender dimensions of the crisis in greater depth. Thank you so much, David. Can you hear me? Can everyone hear me? You're a little faint, Miriam. Just uh, speak loudly and close to the mic. Okay. Thank you so much, David. So as David was introducing, I'm going to speak about gender equality and COVID-19, a legacy of lost lives and lost well-being, based on a joint paper with my colleagues Isis Guardians and Carmen De Paz. So what have we found in this work? Essentially, we found that women and men have been very have been hit very differently through this crisis. Men have lost more lives than women. Women have lost out more in terms of well-being. They've lost more opportunities, jobs, income, and safety than men. How do we know this? And how do we know to which extent women and men have suffered differently from the COVID-19 crisis? We've consulted multiple sources from the World Bank, from the UN agencies and from others around the world to understand better how this crisis has affected men and women differently. The different sources of real-time information have given us snapshots at how people's lives have been affected. They have been affected in health and education or endowments, Secondly, we find differences in livelihoods and economic opportunities. Third, we find differences in the power to make decisions or voice and agency. And overall, we find that the COVID-19 crisis has affected very differently economically and domestic experiences of this crisis, particularly if we look at differences between men and women. I'm first going to talk about education and health or endowments. So starting off with health, as I said earlier, men have generally suffered higher rates of death and higher rates of COVID-19 infections than women. In South Asia, more than three out of four COVID-19 related deaths were among men, and as high as 61% in Latin America and the Caribbean, 59% in MENA. Women have suffered health consequences differently Women generally reported suffering more than men from mental health issues related to COVID-19. So whether you were a woman in Armenia, in Senegal or in Pakistan, you were more likely than a man to be suffering from stress and worry. In Pakistan, for instance, 82% of women compared to 74% of men reported experiencing stress symptoms due to COVID-19. 
In Senegal, women reported being extremely worried more often than men, 56% compared to 46%. And in Armenia, anxiety levels were higher among women. 43% compared to 29% among men reported the most severe level. The common denominator here globally for women was an increase in job losses and an increase in unpaid work at, at home at the same time. In addition though, women have also suffered from reproductive health implications. Not only were pregnant women at higher risk of developing severe symptoms of COVID-19, COVID-19 has also increased the risk of maternal death in childbirth, as well as the risk of stillbirth, the latter by 28%. And now looking at education. So when it comes to education, the evidence is actually not conclusive. We have very limited data so far. However, we have projections from UNESCO. Those, proje those projections predict that boys are at greater risk of not returning to school overall. But those results differ by level of education and also by region. So for instance, in South Asia or in Sub-Saharan Africa, adolescent girls face a particularly high risk of not returning to school according to those projections. What we do know as well is that more boys than girls report an increase in household chores during the pandemic, 63% compared to 43% of boys. One in five girls say that chores prevent them from learning, and this is actually twice the share of boys. Now moving to the second dimension of gender equality, livelihoods and income or economic opportunities. When it comes to staying in a job, gender mattered, and it mattered actually more than education, generation or location. Women were more likely than men to be out of the job during the pandemic. Based on harmonized high frequency phone survey data for 40 countries, our colleague David Newhouse that you just heard earlier, together with Isis Gadis and others, have found that women workers' likelihood of losing their jobs between April and June 2020 was 36% compared to 28% for, for men. In Latin America, women had a 44% higher chance of losing their jobs at the onset of the crisis compared to men. Evidence on how job losses of men and women evolved after this initial phase, however, are not really conclusive yet. But the evidence that we have so far suggests that overall net losses for women have not been compensated for. While paid work went down for women, as I just said, unpaid work uh, went up significantly. Women spend much more time than men on unpaid care and domestic work due to COVID-19. There's also evidence that women were more likely to lose their jobs when they had school-aged children, particularly in Latin America. Female business leaders also affect, were also affected by unpaid work. According to a global survey, women business leaders were around 10 percentage points more likely than male business leaders to report that caring for children, homeschooling and household chores were affecting their ability to focus on work. Women entrepreneurs were at greater risk of hang, having their businesses closed than men. The enterprise survey data shows that in 12 out of 18 countries, businesses with a female top manager were more likely to close, at least temporarily due to the COVID-19 outbreak than businesses that were run by a, a male manager. In 11 out of 18 countries, women-led businesses um, reported shorter survival durations than men-led enterprises. Women-led businesses were also slightly less likely to have secured public support than businesses run by men, especially micro-enterprises. And this is based on a sample of 49 countries. Now moving to decision-making or agency. Let's first turn to reports about increases in violence against women. Data on this issue is very, very sensitive and obviously very hard to obtain. However, the different sources that we've had access to point towards the same direction, a significant rise in violence against women. We have observed steep increases in calls to helplines, in registrations uh, among service providers, police reports, and in a few cases, in dedicated surveys on the topic. So calls to helplines increased immediately after the first lockdowns. For instance, in France, they went up by 30% within the first couple of months, 25% in Argentina, 40% in Malaysia, 
and up to 79% in Colombia and so on. In a survey in Indonesia, 83% of respondents reported increased intimate partner violence in their communities due to COVID-19. And for some countries, we even found evidence that femicide, the killing of women because they're women, often by an intimate partner, have increased significantly, 22% in Brazil just within the first two months of the pandemic. It's important to note here, though, that specific groups of women have been more vulnerable to the risk of suffering violence women refugees or displaced persons, and migrant workers. Women have also been underrepresented when it comes to decision-making under COVID-19. Most national level committees established to respond to COVID-19 have not been equally represented among women and men. In fact, almost three quarters of committees had fewer than one third female membership. Only one committee was fully equal. And on a more individual level, some country studies show women's disadvantage in access to critical information due to lower education levels, exclusion from male networks, limitations on women's mobility and specific power structures within communities and households. Now, when it comes to child marriage and teen pregnancy, similar to education, the picture is not really conclusive. And similar to education, the issue here is a lack of data. However, UNICEF estimates that globally 10 million more girls are at risk of, uh, marry, of getting into child marriage due to COVID-19. The explanation behind those projections is that we know that the pre-COVID drivers of child marriage were really accentuated through the crisis. Closing of schools, closing of businesses, increased poverty, in decline in economic activity, and also the closure of services that were there to prevent this phenomenon to happen in the first place. For teenage pregnancy, the rationale behind projected increases is quite similar, but we may need some more time for the full picture regarding teenage pregnancy to become clear. To wrap up, we have some really valuable data highlighting the differences in experiences between men and women in this crisis. It leaves us with some very concrete conclusions. First, men have experienced the crisis differently. They have lost their lives more from COVID, while women have lost out more in terms of well-being. Second, however, in a very complex world, we can only identify very general patterns. A whole host of other factors, age, education, disability, ethnicity, and so on, all of those will intersect with people's experiences of the COVID-19 crisis. Those factors will overlap with gender and will influence how women and men are vulnerable or resilient to the crisis. And third and lastly, we really need to look more closely at the different legacies of this crisis for women and men. This will not only give us a better picture of the fallout from the pandemic, but it will help us recover faster. With this, I will conclude the gender part and turn to my colleague, Amber. Thank you, Miriam and David. Um, as Miriam and David have shown, the risks to poor were more pronounced from the pandemic due to a combination of factors, lost health, lost jobs, lost education, lost income, and lost capital assets. Uh, which points, so I'm gonna talk about the rising risk of an uneven recovery in an unequal world. There's some evidence that we should be concerned about the risks of higher inequality and social mobility when the recovery is uneven as we are finding early signs of. But to understand the potential impact of the pandemic on inequality, it's good to get a clear picture of inequality before COVID-19. It was a mixed picture. Global inequality has been falling for more than 30 years, mainly because gaps between advanced and developing countries have narrowed. Average inequality within countries, after increasing for a while, has mostly stabilized since 2008. And in fact, in the last decade, income inequality fell in more countries than it rose in spite of the effects of the financial crisis of 2008. And this is what this picture shows. But all is not well. We know that income inequality in some large developing countries has been increasing and social mobility or intergenerational mobility. A key measure of how aspirations of people are being met has not been rising in the average developing economy since the 1960s generation. So this is the context in which the pandemic hit. So we know from the projections that we've made that global poverty is projected to have increased. And the question is, will inequality follow suit? 
So global poverty is projected to have increased mainly due to the economic impact of the pandemic in low and lower middle income countries, because that's where the global extreme poverty is, is, is mainly situated. On average across countries, my colleagues have quoted the numbers, basically a huge proportion, more than one third of those working in developing countries prior to COVID-19 stopped working in the period between April and July across 52 countries. And uh, you know, an even higher percentage of households reported in sub losses for across something like more than 30 countries. Within countries, as David has shown, the immediate impacts of the pandemic, and again, this is, I'm talking of the period between April and, and June, July, fell disproportionately on vulnerable workers, women and youth, and on children in low-income households. So that what the picture shows is the, is the likelihood of income losses, and this happened to be much higher for households with vulnerable workers, who so are basically self-employed or temporary or casual workers, and workers who are not college educated. So because of these reasons, the IMF has done some projections, and they've projected increase in inequality within countries, on average, for emerging and low-income economies, and the main pathway through the, for 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 the, the main pathway through which this happens is because the expected variation in immediate impact by the type of job and sector, which essentially determines whether you're able to work from home and whether your job is actually going to be there. And they have used some assumptions to create these initial estimates. Now, when talking about the pandemic's effect on inequality, it is important to first and I just want to spend one slide on that. First, talking about the unequal impacts across rich and poor countries. As David has shown, we have evidence showing households in poorer countries were more affected in terms of income and job losses. We must remember that these effects will not necessarily show up fully if we just look at GDP shocks across countries. Why? Because household incomes in rich countries, as David has shown, have been supported by massive increases in social assistance that have mitigated impacts on on, on household income and on hunger. This is largely not the case in poorer countries. But it's not just incomes and jobs. Learning was more severely interrupted in lower income countries and countries already suffering from human capital deficits. And this is what this picture is showing. Households in poorer countries were also more likely to resort to coping strategies with long term costs, such as selling assets or reducing food consumption. But let me turn to inequality within countries. And what I am going to talk about is the likelihood or the risk that the pandemic may worsen inequality and social mobility in developing countries because of the patterns of short-term losses that we see, which essentially increases the risk of worsening of inequality and social mobility in the long run. Now, the pandemic's short-term impact on income inequality, we must remember, the very short-term impact on inequality in low-income countries especially is uncertain due to potential countervailing factors. In high-income countries, I've talked about you know, the role that social assistance can play in moderating immediate impacts on inequality. In low-income countries, we must remember that the immediate impacts were larger in urban manufacturing and service sectors, whereas the poorest in low-income countries happen to work in agriculture. So there is a moderating effect on inequality when everybody is hit, but you know, people who are not the poorest are hit a little bit more. So, so, so income inequality in individual low-income countries can go either way in the short run. But regardless of what happens to income inequality in the short run, the risks of worsening, worsening inequality and social mobility in the longer term are real. And this basically happens because of three reasons. First of all, the long-term impact of job losses and business losses in the informal sector could be particularly severe for lower-skilled workers, youth, and women. Strategies to cope with income losses, we pointed out, can, can, can harm income generating capacity of poor households, and disruptions, disruptions to schooling can widen learning gaps between children from rich and poor and between urban and rural households. And these effects are stronger, much stronger in lower income countries and lower middle income countries where pre existing inequalities were more pronounced before the pandemic. So these are the channels through which the current pattern of short run impact, not just on income, but also on education and jobs can lead to, can, can basically pose this risk to the long-term inequality and social mobility trend. Now, we don't have, obviously we don't have evidence for what happens to the long, uh, in the long run yet. Uh, we do have evidence from past disasters, including natural disasters. And what it shows us is that early indications of an unequal recovery 
actually raises concern about a long-term risk. So there's a correlation between how people are recovering and how unequal the recovery process is and how the impacts are going to last in the longer term. Now, this is because the unequal impacts of COVID could be fueling, and we, are, we find some evidence that I'm going to present, uh, so that the unequal impacts could be fueling an unequal pattern of recovery. There are large initial effects on poorer households, which increases rich poor gaps because of lost human entrepreneurial capital assets. Poor households recover slower, increasing inequality, lowering resilience to future crisis, which leads to a self-perpetuating cycle, which is basically what this picture is trying to show. Now, let's look at the period that we would describe as the very early period of recovery between April and September 2020. And we're looking at a set of countries between 17 and 20, depending on the indicators, where the stringency of policy reduced. So these are countries where essentially the policies became less restrictive, so they all saw an improvement. And we saw the good news is that after severe dips in April and June, the income and employment saw a rebound in most countries where policies restricting mobility became less stringent in August and September, uh, which happened to be a majority of countries. The reason why we look at this period for the countries where stringency is reducing, policies are becoming less restrictive, because this period can be taken as an early indication of the nature of recovery for countries where policies became less stringent, which is a large majority of countries. We also see that right after the pandemic, the economic impacts are very strongly correlated with policy stringency, with the, with the restrictiveness of policy measures taken to mitigate the health impact. And that essentially means that as the stringency is being lifted, as policies are being loosened, the patterns that we see are harbingers of what we are likely to see even in, during the longer period of recovery. So very briefly, food security and employment actually improved at a similar rate for different income groups of countries, low-income countries and low-middle and upper and middle and so on. A lot of the employment, improvement in employment was actually driven by improvement in self-employment as opposed to wage employment. And the improvement in food security is associated with recovery in jobs and policies becoming less restrictive. So this is the average pattern we saw across uh, close to 20 countries for which we are able to track this over time between April and September 2020. Now, there are, as I was saying, there are early indications of an uneven jobs recovery in this period. Across, uh, first of all, it's important to remember that by September 2020, even if there was some recovery in these countries, households and individuals still had a long way to go before reaching pre-pandemic levels. And the graph basically shows that. The orange uh, dots are, they measure the total amount of losses relative to what the employment rate was uh, for these different groups pre-pandemic. The blue, uh, the, the blue part of the bar shows the amount to which the, the amount of employment losses that have been recovered, and the purple part is the unrecovered loss. So what we can immediately see is that job recovery on average across 17 countries was not enough to significantly reduce the initial disparities in job losses between women and men, urban and rural, non-college educated and college educated, and young and older workers. So in some cases, the gaps are becoming slightly smaller, the gaps in initial losses, but overall the pattern is that there is, there is, the improvement is not taking place in a pattern which reduces the gaps relative to the initial losses. We also note that self-employment in agriculture became a larger share of total employment and mainly due to job losses in industry and service sectors, which indicates increasing vulnerability of workers. For a smaller set of countries, six countries, we are able to do more detailed analysis. And it's interesting to note, and again, this is not generalizable to the entire developing world, we don't know how generalizable this is beyond these six countries, but at least for these six countries, there is this pattern that controlling for the effects of other factors, being male, college educated, and older, lowers the chance of initial job loss among those who had a job before the pandemic, and increases the chances of job recovery significantly among those who lost job after the pandemic. So for at least for a subset of countries, we see that for less educated workers, for women, and for younger workers, the rate of recovery was lower. This may not be true for all countries, and in the previous graph has shown a more mixed picture, but this is certainly the case for a subset of countries, that people who had lost the most during the crisis are recovering slower, 
and or at least it's the case that they're recovering at a rate which is not closing the gap. Now we have more recent data all the way up to January for a few countries and they show something interesting and again not generalizable. I don't want to generalize but again to raise a concern which is that as policy stringency to decline on average for these countries employment recovery seems to have stalled since August September. Okay, so between September and January, and we're basically showing here as employment as a share of pre-pandemic employment. Okay, so the higher, the better. Uh, and we see that employment recovery is essentially stalled uh, between September and January. And employment continued to improve for these countries more for men than for women. So again, this is pattern of the gaps not closing between men and women, between rural and urban workers for these countries till January 2021. Now, more recent data from countries like Ethiopia and Nigeria also highlight the need to look beyond just employment. For example, in Ethiopia, employment rates were similar to pre-COVID rates by October 2020. But a shift towards more vulnerable types of jobs, self-employment, casual employment, family work that occurred just after the pandemic had not been reversed by October. So which means there are more vulnerable forms of employment, uh, which we seem to have become more common. So finally, um, as uh, David, Miriam, and pre my presentations have shown, that the risks to poor are more pronounced in the pandemic from a variety of factors, including lost jobs and lost education and income and, and capital and so on. And the early signs of recovery are not promising because while there's a lot of heterogeneity across countries, there is an overall sense that things are not improving in terms of inequality, even as countries recover. Uh, by that policy become less stringent. It's critical to build back better, which requires prioritizing equity, sustainability, and building resilience in promoting growth, economic growth that raises living standards for all. So I just want to end with a few quick messages. First of all, equity and access to vaccines is critical globally across and within countries, and that's why developing countries are far behind, they're lagging far behind, and this is because equity and access to vaccine is critical, not just for reducing the health risk, but also for economic recovery uh, across countries. Secondly, making our societies resilient to future crises requires taking on structural inequalities today, which involves narrowing gaps in endowments and capabilities between the haves and have nots of society by helping children and parents transition back to school and back to work facilitating re-entry to level the playing field in labor market, enhancing access to financial services and technology, which the pandemic has shown has become increasingly important, particularly for the micro and small enterprises to, to recover, building an effective and equitable public health system, investing in safety nets and social insurance to reduce the burden on policies to close longer term gaps that emerge due to unequal impact of the shock. If we can reduce the initial unequal impact of shock, in, in uh, and shocks in the nature of future crisis, it will actually reduce the burden on the investment and policies that you make in order to close those gaps in recovery and going forward. So safety nets are extremely important. And of course, we need fiscal, fiscal policy, which raise resources to support these policies, these kind of policies and investment in a fair and efficient way uh, to, 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 uh, to support the recovery. The rising risk, of an uneven recovery in an unequal world is the, is the, is the theme of, 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 of the presentation that we're making. And there's some evidence we should all be concerned about the risks of higher inequality and lower social mobility, which refer to longer term risks, more permanent changes, as opposed to just the immediate impact on income inequality. Uh, I'll just end here. Thanks a lot. Thank you so much, Ambar, Miriam, and David. Um, for those very interesting presentations. Um, we're going to turn now to our panel, um, but I am told that we had um, a video uh, freeze uh, during um, Indermit's remarks, and so I want to introduce the, the panel once again. Um, they are uh, Shamaran Abed, uh, Senior Director of BRAC's Ultra Poor Graduation Program, um, Abigail Adams Prossel, Associate Professor at the University of Oxford. Jonathan Rothwell, Principal Economist at Gallup. Carolina Sanchez Paramo, Glo Global Director of Poverty and Equity here at the World Bank. And Vivi Yulaswati, um, Senior Advisor to the Minister of National Development Planning for Social Affairs and Poverty in Indonesia. 
So, Mr. Abed, let me start with you. Um, what impact has the pandemic had on the poorest in Bangladesh and around the world from what you can see from your work with BRAC? Thank you very much, Elizabeth. I hope you can all hear me. Um, first of all, thanks very much for having me on this panel. Um, and thanks for those very interesting, though quite depressing uh, presentations. So what we've seen on the ground in South Asia and Africa, uh, you know, track very closely to what has been presented today. So I'll, I'll speak mostly about Bangladesh because that's where I'm based and that's uh, the country I know the best. But I think some of these are true for uh, in, in most of the countries where we work and, and across most of the developing world. So, uh, you know, I, I don't think any of this will come as a surprise and you've, you've seen three presentations already, but I mean, the number of people who've, who've dipped into poverty in the last one year uh, in Bangladesh has, is anywhere between 16 and 24 million, depending on wh what study uh, you believe in. And my sense is it's probably towards the higher end of that. Um, but within that, obviously, I mean, that's people who are sort of right just above the poverty line who've now fallen into poverty. But if you look at people who are already below, who've dipped into extreme poverty or even ultra poverty, there, there are many millions more in that. And I think that's the, that's the global 97 million figure that was mentioned. Um, I, I, my sense is it's going to end up being a lot higher than that uh, once they, the, the, the full impact of this, of this pandemic plays out. Um, one thing to keep in mind, though, all of these figures that we're talking about now are, are the impact of the first set of lockdowns that happened sort of between March and June, July of last year. Um, now, in the U.S., for example, I think there is a sense that the pandemic is behind you and things are, things are moving in the right direction. But if you are where I'm based, uh, we are now going into our third wave of the pandemic and the numbers are going up again. Uh, we've had another, another set of lockdowns in April and May and things had started to get better and now it's getting worse again because of the Delta variant and we're probably going back into lockdowns and it's similar situation in most of the countries where we work, um, including uh, Myanmar, uh, Uganda, uh, Liberia and, and uh, other parts of uh, South, South Asia and Africa. So, so, you know, this this is going to be a double, triple whammy and the, the, the full impact of that we haven't even begun to understand yet. But even within what we do know, we've seen some of the very same things. So, um, you know, the poorest have been hit hard. Women have been hit very hard. Um, if, if, we, if, we, if we, you know, think about what we've seen in the last one year, urban poor people in the informal sector in urban areas have been hit particularly hard in Bangladesh. You know, some of these studies claim that 30% of people living in urban slums moved to, from urban to rural areas last year. And about a third of those people never managed to come back. And again, now we've had further migration this year. And again, we, we don't have the data yet, but that's again going to be in, in similar, the similar re region. Social assistance has, again, not only been inadequate, but, but as usual, has not reached the, 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 the extreme poor or the ultra poor. Um, you know, so, uh, so again, uh, just the capability of identifying and getting help quickly to people who are the worst affected by these lockdowns um, has been completely found out. Um, if we look at the edu you know, if we look at education, Bangladesh, you know, Bangladesh stop, uh, you know, closed all schools and colleges uh, at the end of March of 2020 and has not reopened since. So for the last almost 15 months, there have been no schools open. Um, which basically, again, means that if you're middle class or upper middle class, you can you can join Zoom lessons. But if you're poor, uh, you don't have access to that. So the poor children have not been in school at all for uh, for over a year now. So the, the, the learning loss is going to be, again, quite profound. Within that, we're very worried about the trends we're seeing around child marriage, which has gone up. Uh, child pregnancies that have gone up, and we're very, very concerned that even when schools reopen, hopefully later this year, uh, will 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 adolescent girls go back to schools? Uh, if that's a big question mark, and a lot of the thinking that we're doing at BRAC right now is how do we make sure that we can get girls back into schools? Um, uh, violence against women. Again, we've seen uh, 
you know, again, uh, very much agree with a lot of the, a lot of what has been said. I mean, the, the numbers are going up, um, and it's uh, it's something that worries us a lot, us a lot, and it's something that we're trying to support as well. So, so yeah, I, I don't think I've said anything new, but everything that was mentioned in those presentations we've seen play out in front of our eyes in in the countries where we work. Thank you. Um, Dr. Adams Prossel, let me turn to you now. Um, you've been tracking the labor market impacts of the pandemic in real time, um, including for women, mainly in advanced countries. How do your findings compare with what you've heard about the impacts in the developing countries that the presentations covered? Um, thanks so much for the question, Elizabeth. Um, so, yeah, as you say, um, I'm one of the co-founders of the COVID Inequality Project. We were, we've were we been running surveys yeah, mainly um, in the US, uh, UK and Germany to better understand the labour market impacts of the pandemic. I've also been a specialist advisor to the um, UK Parliament Select Committee um, on, um, on equality, uh, focusing on the gendered economic impacts um, of the pandemic. Now, I think there are kind of three dimensions to your question in terms of how, like, how do we think about the comparison between developed and developing countries? So the first is the nature of the shock being any different um, across countries. The second is what are the insurance mechanisms that are available to households to actually smooth out that shock? And the final component is how do we think about the transmission between, if you like, a short term shock and long term outcomes? And why might that be different across countries? So in terms of the nature of the shock, um, you know, COVID has essentially been um, a direct shock straight to the real economy. Um, it's quite different, if you like, from other recessions that we've seen over you know the last 10 15 years which often like kind of propagate from the financial sector or propagate like then into the real economy and in terms of do the findings that um you know that i've seen and which i know about in developed economies they tally with the evidence we've heard today um yes so given that we you know, in, in developed economies as well, we have occupational segregation um, of women um, of ethnic minority communities and by age into different sectors of the economy and systematically as well into different types of jobs. We've seen that um, younger workers, women workers um, uh, and, um, and those with less education have been systematically more exposed to the economic crisis. Um, than, than their counterparts. But then, of course, what is very different in developed economies is the degree to which certain insurance mechanisms exist, which kind of act to smooth that shock out differentially. So, um, as has been mentioned um, in, the, um, in the presentations today, particularly by David, um, in a lot of um, uh, in a lot of OECD countries, what we see is the setup of short-time work schemes or Kurzarbeit schemes where the government has essentially stepped in to subsidize the wages um, of workers in order to keep workers and firms together. And also, well, at least in the UK context, that furlough payment is hugely much more generous than the, than, than the benefit system that even exists um, in, 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 in the UK. So what we've seen is, um, in many countries where these schemes exist, essentially a freezing of the labour market for the, last, for, for, for the last year. So we haven't seen as big an impact of unemployment and on um, uh, measured inequality in terms of wages than we've seen in countries um, without these schemes. Beyond the government, another key insurance mechanisms come through work and work relationships. So oh, even oh, in the surveys that we've ran, we've seen that um, it's been um, uh, certain firms and workers in advanced economies have been able to make investments to make it easier for them to work from home, um, both in terms of how do you upgrade as a worker your own living space in terms of internet connections, in terms of productivity enhancing tools at home, and also in terms of firms, in terms of the ability to organize technology to facilitate remote working and coordination of a um, you know of 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 disparate of a disparate workforce, and those types of technologies and that type of ability to work from home is of course going to play out very differently across different countries. Now the final the final insurance mechanism, if you like, um, is self insurance, and of course that's going to differ systematically as well between 
um, developed in a developing economy. So what I mean by this is how much savings and how much kind of margin of error do you have before you know you before things get really bad. So again, the UK context that I know well more well because of the policy work that I've done. You see big inequality, of course, across the income distribution in terms of how this shock has translated into both income and consumption falls. So whilst there have been income losses at the top of the income distribution, consumption has fallen by even more, causing huge amounts of save, like disproportionately high saving rates um, amongst rich, richer household. Whereas at the poor, that's disproportionately falling out in terms of debt because you can't scale back and um, spending on necessities as much. Okay, so final, finally, um, on, in terms of what's this transmission between a short term shock and long term outcomes, um, I, so I guess wanted to pull out two things here. First is actually continuing the comments which were just made. We're a long way from recovery in lots of countries, especially because of inequality and access to vaccines. So whilst um, we might be thinking about emerging into recovery in certain countries where we have effective vaccines at the moment, um, that's not the case in all economies. And so the longer that this goes on, the more, if you like, you're going to be stretching out the existence of those insurance schemes even longer, potentially increasing the potential for long term hysteresis effects. Um, in terms of actually, though, um, how do we think about the nature of the shocks to education, to women's employment, um, especially something I, I think about a lot into longer term outcomes? We've got, and, and also on, on young workers, there's a lot of evidence um, from previous recessions, from previous pandemics, to suggest that there are quite, there are, that, 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 you know, these things do have long term effects and that you need active policy to step in in order to smooth them out. Um, I'm not saying that that's working particularly well in some developed economies, but 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 there, there, you know there are there are, for example, tutoring schemes on the ground, and we are thinking about more tailored um, uh, you know approaches in terms of work support. The final thing, actually, I'll say on women, which I think and, and the gendered response, um, in, at least in terms of women who are already in the labour market, I think across countries there is still. Um, uh, childcare is still not seen as an economic type of investment. It's still not seen as a public economic good, which has high returns, given that it actually facilitates, you know, uh, for all your caregivers, basically, actually being able to work outside the home and potentially um, kind of in, you know, in, in, in other jobs which provide economic returns. Um, if we don't fix that, you know, some of these issues are going to keep coming up, um, sadly. Indeed. Thank you. Um, let me turn to Dr. Rothwell. Um, your organization, Gallup, uh, recently released its 2020 World Poll findings on how much people's lives in 116 countries and areas have been affected by the pandemic. What do the, these findings suggest for my, what might be happening to inequality? Well, the, the findings really confirm a lot of what y your colleagues have already said in terms of poor countries being hit harder at the country level and then within countries people with lower socioeconomic status being much more likely to lose income or lose their job or say that subjectively they've been more adversely affected uh, which was measured in several ways uh, so the, the the big picture is very much consistent i want to say first of all that gallup is is proud to be a partner of the world bank and and several other organizations that contributed to this this massive data collection effort we, we were able to, to get over 300,000 responses from, from 117 countries uh, related to our COVID waves. And uh, the nice thing is there we've got, we can contrast OECD countries with, with the poorest, some of the poorest countries in the world. And it's really striking to see that even though the disease burden as measured uh, by deaths per capita or cases per capita, even using more advanced uh, measures to try to, to account for measurement error, the disease burden seems to have hit richer countries harder, but the economic burden is, is overwhelmingly hitting poorer countries harder. And uh, so we're, we're starting to try to dig into why that might be the case. Some of the things that have, have come up are uh, access to broadband internet, uh, Certainly, that is much higher. Those rates are much higher in rich countries, and that allowed a much larger share of the population to continue working at home. 
Uh, that seems to be part of it. Others have already mentioned David had some very nice data on the the government relief efforts, and that's uh, that undoubtedly had a positive benefit uh, for in rich countries. Uh, and so we're we're but we are observing this pattern across countries. It looks very much like global inequality between countries has increased. Now the other issue which we've we're we're working on and we've we're starting to try to publish. Some some academic papers as well as some popular articles is looking at this within country inequality, and there we're we're seeing that rates of job loss are are roughly three four times higher in some cases between workers with uh, low levels of education, say less than secondary education, and those with a tertiary education. Likewise, those in the bottom quintile of the income distribution and those in the top in, in, in income top of the income distribution are seeing very large gaps in whether or not they were laid off or experienced income losses. Now, the good news is there it's not entirely inevitable. While we while we have found that pattern in just about uh, well in in most of of the world and most countries some countries such as the ones that uh, Abby uh, mentioned have uh, novel approaches to preventing job loss or have used short time work schemes. These are mostly Western and Northern European countries have managed to uh, mitigate job losses for those with low levels of education in low incomes. And uh, maybe that points away. The, the research is very preliminary because it's hard to measure those policies across a large number of countries. But when you contrast the United States, for example, which relied very heavily on unemployment insurance benefits, but didn't invest as much on the efforts to prevent job loss with countries like the Netherlands, Germany, Switzerland, Denmark, UK, you see much higher job losses overall in the United States and also a much larger gap between rich and poor in terms of who was laid off than in those other countries. So that makes me think that that must have been part of it. The other country level predictors of of that rising inequality uh, in terms of lower socioeconomic status be individuals being at greater risk of layoff include the level of income inequality going into the pandemic. So uh, even controlling for GDP per capita, the age of the population, the disease burden of the population, countries with higher Gini coefficients going into the pandemic saw a larger gap emerge during the pandemic in terms of uh, job loss rates between uh, class. And uh, the other policy that really stands out is the stringency, the overall stringency of, of the response. Uh, we see that uh, countries that had more restrictive lockdowns, uh, not only had more job losses controlling for other measurable factors, uh, but also had a, a wider gap between between rich and poor. And we used uh, the Oxford University measures for this at, at the measured at the at the daily uh, level. So countries that were able to maybe lock down early, but then relax restrictions and reopen restaurants and reopen schools like Denmark, for example, um, look a lot better than than the countries that had severe lockdowns for extended periods of time. Thank you, um, Carol, let me turn to you. Um, can you tell us more about what the World Bank is doing to track inequality caused by the pandemic? Lisa, that's sure. I can I can try to give a bit of an overview or or what, what we've been doing. Although it seems that that is really sort of continuously work in progress, and we're having to reinvent uh, what we do because of the very fluid nature of the crisis. Um, but maybe just to paint a bit the story. Uh, so very early in the pandemic, as others have pointed out, I think it became uh, very clear uh, that this pandemic would have very large impacts and that those impacts would be uneven. And at that point, that was a guess, but I think all of us sort of had that intuition to see how things were unrolling. And therefore, it was urgent that we understood who was going to affect, be affected and how, right, as we started to mount the first round of responses. So in these early days, what we did was really just use data that was already available to us, which was mostly pre-pandemic data from household surveys and other sources. 
and use micro simulation models to really sort of try to predict, you know, on, you know, based on what we knew about the nature of the crisis, who was likely to be affected and to identify these groups that were at risk. And, and that early exercise, even though it was relatively crude in some ways, was quite critical in informing uh, first in profiling the new poor, right? Understanding, you know, who would be likely to be pushed into poverty, you know, who would be likely to be affected. And then in using that information to inform the early efforts, uh, particularly around the expansion of safety nets across different countries. Uh, so, so that, you know, that, that was sort of our first effort. It, however, became quite clear that the pandemic was evolving very rapidly and that these impacts were not static, right? That different channels of transmission were emerging and that the impacts were varying across time, across space, across groups. And therefore, you know, this early approach was only going to take us so far. We, need, we really needed to have real-time data to monitor what was happening on the ground. Um, as you mentioned in your in your introduction, um, this happened precisely at the time when statistical operations came to a halt around the world. So at a moment where we all were craving for information, we were living at the same time in an information void. And that was really the motivation for the unprecedented data collection exercise that the bank launched uh, last spring, in the spring of 2020, uh, using phone surveys to collect real-time information on how households and individuals were affected. And there was a parallel exercise that reached out to firms to also understand how firms were affected and to use that information to, uh, to inform what countries were doing in the form of the response, but also our own operational work. And, um, and you know, it's reassuring, and, and, and that's the data that, that we are looking at today, right, that this presentation was based on. And it's reassuring to hear that, you know, those messages and that data resonate with both what some of the panelists have seen at the country level, as well as with similar exercises uh, that have been conducted by others. And then thirdly, you know, wherever possible, that information was then combined with other sources of data, you know, geospatial data or administrative data where that was available, to try to create a much more granular picture and to understand where these inequalities were starting to emerge. Uh, you know, looking at differences across locations, differences across groups at a more granular level. Um, so I think what, what, what so that, that's some of what we are doing and, and we will continue to do. I think when you look at the evidence that these different efforts have produced, um, and I look back a year and a half at what we expected to see back then and what we are seeing now, I think it's fair to say that, you know, we see a combination of sort of things that were expected, but to some extent also things that were unexpected. Um, and that, you know, we also see that inequalities that emerged very early in the pandemic are not disappearing. And in fact, I think a lot of what we heard from Miriam, David and Ambar was this emphasis on the risk that these inequalities really began entrenched. And, and sort of um, undermine people's ability to recover. So this, to me, really emphasizes the need to sustain these monitoring efforts, right? To, to continue to monitor how uh, different groups are being impacted, the extent to which they are able to take advantage of the recovery, and if they are not, you know, to ensure that we are tailoring efforts in, on the policy front uh, to meet their needs. And it's also important that we don't sort of throw away the lessons that we've learned during the crisis in terms of our monitoring efforts. So one thing that we've done at the bank is work very closely with national statistical offices whenever possible to implement these phone surveys. So this has truly been a collaboration between us as an institution and country institutions. And the goal there was to build capacity at the country level so that you know the ability to monitor crisis in real time and to provide policymakers with this real time information is something that outlasts the crisis, and we will continue to do that over the next uh, few months. Uh, let me stop there. Thank you, Carol. Uh, let me turn now to Dr. Yula Swati. Um, can you give us a picture of how COVID has affected Indonesia um, in terms of poverty and inequality? Elizabeth for the question and also thank you for having me uh, in the panel. 
Uh, yes, Indonesia has been part of the country that hit most uh, by the COVID-19, uh, particularly when the first cases found in the, uh, the beginning of March and uh, we had a lockdown for three months. Uh, the economy plums uh, or, or uh, uh, yeah from from uh, five to minus five point uh, three in the second quarter of 2020, uh, and uh, when the survey of uh, September 2020 uh, showed that the, our poverty uh, rate has actually increased uh, in 20. 18 actually Indonesian poverty rate has been a uh, single digit but uh, due to COVID the number of new poor increased by uh, 2.76 million people uh, from the September uh, 2019. The increase particularly uh, uh, happened in urban uh, where the urban poverty increased by 1.32 uh, percent higher than in rural areas. Uh, despite that for various uh, social assistance and economy recovery programs has been done, the social capital in rural community help uh, them uh, more to be, I mean, help them to be more uh, resilient. Uh, actually, the COVID-19 also impacted to the middle class. Uh, again, particularly in uh, urban uh, areas, uh, we can show from the growth incidence curve that the people, particularly from the uh, aspire middle class, also uh, reduce the, their consumption level um, most. Uh, the, the poor and vulnerable uh, groups in rural areas uh, due to have a relatively high resilience by having a higher social capital uh th their consumption level is not hit uh, as as in urban uh, areas for the uh, gini ratio uh we experienced also an increase uh both in march and so september 2020 uh in which the, the national uh, gini index uh, increased from the uh, 80 uh, 38 to become uh 38 from 0.5. So, uh, uh, however, this increases is not happen in in all provinces. Only some provinces that uh, hit most, uh, particularly by the by the COVID-19. In the quarter, uh, in the uh, uh, first quarter of uh, 2021, uh, the economy has uh, uh, better off, still a contraction to minus uh, 0 0.74. However, from the from regions, we could see that the, uh, that the economic growth has uh, quite uh, uh, diverged, in which only eight out of the 34 already uh, have a positive uh, growth, while the rest still uh, uh, contracted. Mining and plantations area experienced faster recovery due to the rising demand and prices, uh, but uh, the rest, the, the economy still uh, contracted, particularly uh, where the labor intensive sectors uh, 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 still uh, experience uh, contraction. For example, in Bali, uh, still contracted up until minus 9.8 and it has a uh, domino, domino effects uh, not only from the, the the sectors like in uh, uh, tourism but also applying to the transportations and uh, warehousing the accommodations and also drinks and food so this kind of like a divergence patterns of economic growth may have an impact of slowing progress in reducing inequality as well as in a poverty. Uh, we could also see uh, some vulnerability sign in which uh, there are increasing high informality, uh, also in adequate coverage of the social safety and health system, 
and there are some problem that uh, on the environmental issues and climate change that are not addressed and also uh, some lacking adequate nutrition and food losing and education so uh, let me explain more at the household level there have been several uh, studies that shows uh, on the educations the, the, the disruption may lead to the learning loss and later on uh, it may also impact to the earning penalty uh, on the education side uh, 57 percent of household actually don't have a reliable internet and there have been several uh, impacts from the uh, uh, learning uh, distance learning for example one out of four parents don't have enough time to company uh, or having learning materials and also supported facilities to have children and in fact five out of ten children experience uh, at least two following conditions like a boring hard to concentrate hard to sleep and also, and also have a fatigue or a stress and in fact six out of ten teachers had difficulties with teaching applications on health conditions uh, there have been some uh, problems due to the difficulties to get immunization as well as uh, uh, prenatal and antenatal for the pregnant mothers and it leads to the increasing numbers of malnutrition of the pregnant mother as well as on the child development there have been some cases on the children with difficulties who have a difficulty to access in information in relate to the COVID and uh, health conditions on the welfare uh, like I mentioned earlier, around 70.5% uh, of the people experiencing declining income, uh, there, are, there were around 29 million uh, workers have been impacted by the COVID-19. Uh, it is only 2.5 actually that lost their job, due, uh, particularly for the uh, uh, young uh, workers because they lack experience, uh, while others uh, need or experience uh, reducing the, the the time or or cut the, the income. And also, there have been several uh, report uh, on in the increasing the intensity use of the gadget by the children, in which increased cases of online harassment of crime and also a uh, mental disorder. Thank uh, you very much, Dr. Yuliswati. You. Um, I, um, I wanna turn now, uh, as you know, this event is being streamed live on uh, World Bank Live, as well as Twitter, YouTube, and LinkedIn. And um, you can follow it on Twitter using the hashtag inclusive growth. Um, we have a question from one of our viewers. Um, Reedy Mahob asks, how can youth Play a role in building back better, um, and I'll just throw this open to to any of the panelists who would like to weigh in on it. I have no idea because I'm very old. Uh, <laughs> I guess we have to ask some of the youth around here. <laughs> <laughs> um, thoughts are thoughts are welcome from any of you on that question. I'm, I know you weren't prepared for it necessarily. Maybe a couple of reactions on on my side. You know, more impressionistic than anything else. But because uh, you know, we also know that youth have been dramatically affected in some ways during this crisis, right? Um, but to me, it seems that this is a crisis where we've all been forced to innovate in a variety of ways, right? We just talked about how we've innovated in terms of trying to monitor what was happening, but that there's also been quite a bit of innovation, I think, happening on the policy side, right? In terms of how we've reached households or tried to reach them, uh, how we've supported businesses and so on. And, and I think we, we generally tend to sort of think about youth and, and kind of younger workers as, as a source of innovation because they look at things with different eyes and, and I think we have an opportunity here 
as we start moving into the recovery uh, to tap into that in a variety of ways. Um, we haven't really touched much in this discussion about the role that digital, for example, technology has played, both uh, in the way that we've responded to the crisis and how we've leveraged that to ensure that people continue to have access to basic services like education, but also, uh, you know, Adi talked earlier about the ability to work from home, right, in many of the developed countries and so on. Um, and, you know, it's undeniable that there are generational divides, uh, you know, as well as income divides on the digital space. And I think that's an area where we could see a lot of rethinking of how services are provided, how work takes place, what the nature of work is. And I suspect that a lot of that could be driven by younger workers, by students coming into labor markets that are going to be deeply transformed by this crisis. Um, we also have been talking about the fact that this crisis could provide an opportunity for us to think about um, helping countries grow in a slightly different way, right? It's important that they grow because we need to get out of, of the crisis, but maybe there are ways in which we can think about that, that emphasize sustainability a little bit more and that are more aligned with climate change considerations. And again, I think we've seen again and again that youth are a very powerful voice in that space uh, in terms of voicing their concerns about the impact of climate change, and calling for solutions in the policy sphere that attend to that. So it would be great to tap, I think, into that potential as we all think about, you know, how we could do things a little bit differently moving forward. So, so those are a couple of ideas, again, very high level, but I think ways where we can benefit from that new thinking coming in. Thank you, Carol. Um, so now I, I want to throw out a question to, to each of the panelists who'd like to answer it. Um, and in just a few words, what, what policy measures are most pressing for governments to take and development partners to support right now to ensure a broad-based recovery from the pandemic? I can go in, in alphabetical order or, or you can jump in as you, you feel moved. Yeah, maybe I can say a, f a couple of things and then um, others I'm sure will join in. Um, first of all, um, I, I think it goes without saying that the, 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 the biggest inequality that we need to fix right now very quickly is the one on vaccines, right? So uh, the world's not going to come out of the pandemic while if when the global south doesn't have access to vaccines and we're vaccinating, you know, millions of people daily in the global north. So that's something that we've got to work on immediately. That's, that's just the first thing that needs to get fixed. Um, but, if, but beyond that, once we, you know, sort of get past the health issue and get into sort of the economic issues, uh, I think, uh, as I said, in countries like, like Bangladesh or parts of South Asia and Africa, we are going to live with this for a while longer. So how we can get social assistance quickly to vulnerable populations when, when countries go in, in and out of lockdowns uh, is something we need, to, we need to figure out. We've done some work since, since last year. We're, I think, a little bit better placed in Bangladesh, for example, this year compared to last year with some of the work on digital payments and things like that, but still far from adequate. Um, and the other thing is uh, related to that is, is urban social protection. Um, all of our social safety net programs are based on rural poor, and we have really inadequate urban social, social protection programs. So when you have a lockdown where cities get hit harder, um, you know, we just don't have, we just don't have the systems in place to support poor people in urban areas quickly enough. So that's, that's something we need to fix, again, short term. In the longer term, as we come out and build back better, I mean, I think we've got to, you know, continue to um, invest in, in, in programs, interventions, or comprehensive sort of uh, programs that build resilience. And that's where, obviously, things like graduation approach, other approaches that build resilience over time, rather than just support sort of short-term consumption, uh, it, it are things we need to we need to put a lot more effort on uh, financial inclusion, better social safety nets, better social protection, and programs that build resilience. So let me stop there. If I may add, yes, please. Yeah, uh, the easiest way for the government to do in the in the first uh, year of the uh, the pandemic actually expanding our uh, existing social protection programs by increasing the size of benefit, uh, modify the time of delivery. Uh, for example, for the CCT, we, we expand the index of, of the size of the benefit. 
and also uh, expand the choices of, of the food programs, not only including the carbohydrate or protein, but also using it to, to purchase the vitamin, uh, the hand sanitizer, and also uh, improve the child sensitive intervention for some programs, for example, uh, in uh, providing the internet quota subsidy for the students. Uh, we provide like 35 gigabyte for our almost 40 million students and 50 gigabyte for uh, college students. And also strengthening the resilience of the children by uh, in, increase the awareness and readiness, uh, particularly for the vulnerable uh, uh, children uh, by providing the counseling, uh, the family counseling. On the economic recovery, uh, we provide, I mean, the government provide uh, the creative economy for the MSMEs by promoting a new MSMEs and also uh, entrepreneurship uh, trainings, uh, improving the business ecosystems and worker social security, and also on the productive labor force quality. Uh, there have been several uh trainings like promoting the digital blended trainings improving the implementation of training certification and also uh, placement by uh work together with uh, some private uh, entity to accelerate the job absorption uh also um we did some mapping and projecting the labor market demand and try to match the job demand and the job uh, supply and also uh create a new program, i.e. the pre-employed car card, and also a subsidy for low-income workers by providing a social security premium relaxation, and also death restructuring, as well as developing the integrated social protection system. Thank you. Maybe Elizabeth, if I can just add a word, um, you know, it, it, it's, I think, in terms of the specific policies that were highlighted uh, both in Indonesia and, and uh, Bangladesh, you know, fully agree. And I just want to highlight that in order for all of that to be possible, we do know that countries are going to have to both mobilize additional fiscal resources as well as, you know, have a look at their existing spending and maybe reprioritize some of that to support, you know, the kinds of interventions that we were discussing. And, and you do see this conversation already unfolding because there's been an enormous fiscal effort that has already taken place in the past uh, year or year and a half. So I think moving forward, you know, just keeping in the back of our mind that as we support all of these policies, the way in which we mobilize resources and the way in which we spend needs to be both fair and effective. And, uh, and that there are a few things that we can do to ensure that, but that will be an important discussion moving forward. Um, I just wanted to highlight that. Thanks, Carol. Um, Dr. Raffal, do you want to speak to this question about policy measures as well? I do. Uh, I first of all just want to second what uh, Shamaran and others have said about the importance of, of getting the vaccine out. Uh, but uh, beyond that, I think one of the insights that's come from our analysis of of the economic effects of, of COVID is, is really the surprising robustness of, of the relationship between stringency and job loss. And of course, we have to consider the fact that those, those more stringent policies may be saving lives at a large scale. It's, it's, it doesn't jump out of the data, but it seems intuitive that if people are social distancing, they're going to be much less likely to transmit the virus. I think the challenge for countries around the world that still have not vaccinated a large percentage of their population is to try to encourage economic activity as much as possible under safe risk mitigating conditions. And that may be things like encouraging people to wear masks rather than shutting down businesses. Uh, there are other more costless ways of you know, uh, policies along those lines that that countries could explore, but that would be that would be the insight I think coming from from our work is that the the stay at home orders and the business closures have have had a very devastating effect on economies around the world and and income inequality within countries. So to the extent that they can be avoided without the virus uh, getting out of control, that uh, is something that I would certainly recommend. 
Thank you. Um, so we're running a little over because of the late start. Um, so I want to turn now um, to Carol for some closing remarks. Thank you, Elizabeth, and thanks to um, both the three presenters and our panelists, and of course to everybody that that sort of stayed with us, even though we are running a little bit over time. Uh, again, you know, very much sorry about those technical glitches early on, but I'm glad that uh, we made it uh, till the end. Uh, this has been a very, I think, rich and interesting discussion, although a sovereign one, as I think Shanran uh, mentioned earlier. Uh, it's been, I think, a reminder that while in some parts of the world we do start to feel like we are turning the corner on the pandemic, uh, in many other parts of the world, that's not what things look like at the moment, and that there are still many who are suffering from the impacts of the pandemic. Uh, and possibly facing new pandemic waves and lockdowns. So I think the analysis that we looked at today and you know, really what that may mean in terms of how we think about uh, those repeated shocks was critical. I think the, the discussion also highlighted uh, the risk of an uneven recovery that was really sort of in a way the focus of what we wanted to talk about today. And that uh, if that were to happen, we would see many being left behind. Uh, including many uh, that were already disadvantaged before the crisis, right? So we would see this very, you know, very much a compounding effect of existing inequalities and disadvantages. Um, at the same time, you know, not to sort of be all doom and doom, you know, I think some of the discussions that we've had today, particularly in the panel section about um, the policy response, you know, some of the things that countries have done over the past. Uh, year and a half and the fact that those have actually made a difference you know for how people and households have experienced the crisis uh including protecting them against some of the worst impacts of the crisis you know does give us um a solid foundation to to move forward and to build on those successes to also sort of reflect on you know what worked and what didn't and continue to do uh, a good job moving forward and and you know adding to that of course the challenge of the vaccines which you know many of us have highlighted right which which now emerges as a potential additional dimension for inequality but the discussion today i think has also highlighted the importance of evidence right and of not driving in the dark at a moment like this and um and how data and analysis are critical to inform these policy decisions and to inform implementation and to allow countries to course correct in situations that are as fluid as the one that we've been living in over the past um, few months. And, and I'm glad that we got to sort of share some of the data that we produce, but we also heard from others and the efforts that they've been making in that space because they are all complementary. And, you know, I think it's frequently said that necessity is the mother of innovation. And I think this crisis, again, has spoken to that very directly. Uh, we've seen governments, development partners, and others, you know, innovate in a variety of ways. Uh, so maybe to end on sort of a positive note, I think we have an enormous opportunity here to reflect on those lessons, uh, learn from them, and in a way take that learning and carry it forward uh, so that, you know, when we come out of this crisis, we have better policies and better ways to tackle future crises. Uh, I hope we won't have to live through something like the last year and a half anytime soon, but it is true that crisis will continue to happen and we just need to be better prepared to handle them as they come at us. Uh, but thank you again, everybody, for joining, and I hope you take something useful uh, from this discussion for your work moving forward. Thank you, Carol. Thanks to our panelists, presenters, and to the audience. Good day. <laughs>